First off, I want to thank everyone for your comments and support. The response has been great and beyond any expectations. I'm grateful and honored by your words and good vibes. I went from 150 subscribers to almost 1600. This has inspired me to keep going and share with you guys my passion for music. I have some good news and bad news. First, the good news. After completing the requirements, my application for YouTube Partner has been approved. I can now monetize videos through advertising revenue. But now the bad news. Because of the content itself, the The Zeppelin documentary episodes are not eligible for monetization. I want to cover the band's entire history in a sort of Enzeplopedia Britannica collection. I wasn't going to ask for this upfront, but because I cannot make money from ad revenue on these videos, I find it a timely matter to discuss. If you feel this project has made an impact on your passion for Led Zeppelin or has awakened the fan within, I would like to ask you for a donation via Patreon so we can go past any YouTube monetization barriers and support the time and effort these videos need so we can celebrate Led Zeppelin's body of work. Your Patreon support will also keep my family members happy as they are worried about my hermit lifestyle making videos day and night. They say I shouldn't be locked away in my room so much. I just tell them I have a fever and the only prescription. Yeah, it's more copies of Enter the Outdoor, but it's also <laughs> making videos, making music. I've shared my Patreon link in the description below. As a member, you can contact me directly with suggestions, ideas, and also receive exclusive content in the ways of guitar-oriented pieces, both covers and original compositions. I want to give a special shout out to DK Wilson, my first patron. I really appreciate your support. Welcome to the Enzeplopedia. Some of you have asked me if I could narrate these episodes myself. I'm definitely looking forward to it on future episodes. I brainstormed my ideas and came up with a good selection of future Zeppelin topics I want to explore in detail. With your patron support, I am committed on delivering weekly episodes of Led Zeppelin's history. So hopefully you can support me and I'll keep these videos coming down the pipeline. Before we go into episode 3, I want to give some background on this project. Back in June I was feeling dizzy and exhausted. Next thing I knew, I tested positive for COVID and had to go into isolation. My first time with this thing, despite having 3 COVID shots, it was just awful. Past my day job working from home duties, I resorted to my record collection for comfort. I've always wanted to see a documentary on Intro the Outdoor, and while going through my archives, I came across a Zeppelin cover I did back in 2015. The song was All My Love, and it became the music theme intro for these videos. I worked long hours on the script, organizing my ideas, going over the details, and wishing I didn't have COVID. Because of COVID complications, I just couldn't speak without coughing like crazy, pandemic style. Narrating this was off the table. I was exhausted from coughing, and I really thought doing the documentary was impossible. Because I wanted to meet the August 15th deadline for the album's release anniversary, I decided to go with my British friend's voiceover talents and edited the whole series with her voice through endless nights looking for the right pace and visual design. Once again, I thank you for watching. Please subscribe, support me on Patreon, and get ready for episode 3 as we go back to both the events of 1977 and the band recording their fourth song at Polar Studios in 1978. Bye bye.
January 25, 1977. Led Zeppelin's North American tour went on sale. Shows sold out in less than 30 days with a demand unprecedented. 52 concerts were scheduled over a four-month period for 1.3 million ticket holders. Tickets sold at a rate of 72,000 a day. Their instruments and equipment got shipped to the United States. The start date was pushed from March to April 1st as Robert contracted laryngitis. Jimmy didn't touch his guitar for a month. Led Zeppelin had their own 45-seat Boeing 707 to shuttle them between cities. Caesar's Chariot, the plane was owned by Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas. The 11th hour and final visit to the state saw riots and police having to control wild crowds. Negative vibes were felt within their organization. A busy schedule and massive stadium venues became the blueprint for many artists in the 80s and 90s. Their biggest and most legendary tour. A tale of extremes. They began lining up last Thursday, camped out in sleeping bags, blankets, or lawn chairs. What was the situation like? Can you describe it? Yeah, it was people pushing, shoving each other, people falling down, a lot of people passing out, girls fainting everywhere, and they just broke a mirror when I was leaving after I got my ticket. You were about the first person to get your tickets, right? I was the first. How many did you buy? Six. What did they go for? Um, 9.75 was the ones I got. How long were you in line? I was here since 6 o'clock yesterday night. Was it worth it? Yep. All the way. Would you stand in line like this for any other group besides Led Zeppelin? Just a couple of groups. I love Led Zeppelin too, so it's great. Look at all these people, you know, what can you say? It's just great. You might say that the wait for the Led Zeppelin has just begun. By dawn today, there were about a thousand waiting for tickets to go on sale. mid-70s drool, sedative and hypnotic prescription drugs, cocaine, groupies, heroin, sniff and tears. Over the top and self-indulgence, the beast was unleashed, madness everywhere. The Enterprise cruising emotional autopilot, delivering three-hour performances while losing themselves in the sinister arms of their closed-door empire. Vikings coming back to North America proved Led Zeppelin was the dominant band of the 70s, yet their swan song was being written. Jimmy Page was razor sharp thin from his heroin addiction and liquid only diet. His playing was a hit or miss, a tightrope between great and disaster. Robert was still careful of jumping around while going full force on and off the stage. The acoustic set was revived and allowed Robert to sit down and rest his leg for recovery. Bonzo's alcoholism reached new heights of insanity. The staff was told not to look him in the eye and speak only if spoken to. Quote John Paul Jones, at our very worst, we were better than most people and at our very best we could just wipe the floor with a lot of them.
by 1977, I was 29 and that sort of wild energy, that was there in the beginning, had come to the point, where we were showbooting a bit. Unfortunately, we had no choice. We were on tours, where places were going ape shit. There was no way of containing the energy in those buildings. It was insane. And we became more and more victims of our own success. I felt quite remote from the whole thing, I wasn't comfortable with the group at all. We'd gone right through the hoop, and, because my hoop was on fire, I didn't know if it was worth it anymore. Addiction to powders was the worst way to see yourself, a waste of your time and everybody's time. You make excuses to yourself why things aren't right, or about what's happening to your potential. You lie to yourself first and rub your nose later. It was time to get out. Thank you! <coughs> July 22nd. In his autobiography, rock concert promoter Bill Graham recounted Zeppelin's tour manager Richard Cole calling him the day before the first of the Oakland shows. Cole developed substance abuse problems over the years. He demanded the immediate delivery of a $25,000 advance on the show's earnings. When Graham brought the money to the band's hotel, he realized what the call was really about. This was drug money. July 23rd. The band headed out to San Francisco for the first of two shows at Oakland Coliseum. Because they cancelled their 1975 dates, expectations were high for these performances. Promoter Bill Graham organized these daylight shows, Zeppelin's first since San Francisco 1973 at Kiesa Stadium, also put together by Three Day at the Green shows, were held since May headlined by Fleetwood Mac, Santana, The Eagles and Peter Frampton. Zeppelin was the biggest draw, both their weekend dates sold out in record time. When the band's road crew and security arrived at the Coliseum, Graham was further disturbed. I heard about the ugliness of their security, how they were just waiting to kill. They had these bodyguards who had police records in England. They were thugs. Zeppelin's security coordinator was notorious London gangster, John Bindon. He was Prince Margaret's alleged lover for a while which became a scandal in the UK. Their July 23rd show ended and the war began backstage. A security member from Bill Graham's staff, Jim Matsorgis, spotted an 11-year-old boy taking off a dressing room sign. He tried to stop him. The boy was Peter Grant's son, Warren. Bonham saw the incident and reported it to Grant who went looking for Matsorgis. Graham tried to intervene, but Grant and Bindon found Matsorgis taking shelter in a trailer. They threw Graham out, shut the door, and began to mercilessly beat up the staffer. Graham tried to get back into the room to stop a beating, but Cole guarded the door wielding a pipe. Mitsorkis later said that, when Binton tried to pop his eye out, he summoned his strength and escaped the trailer. Graham had him rushed to the hospital. He was furious and threatened legal action. That night he got a call from Zeppelin's lawyer Steve Weiss with a message. The band would find it difficult to play tomorrow, unless you sign a waiver indemnifying them against all lawsuits. Graham waited until 3 a.m. before making a decision. July 24. Led Zeppelin was due on stage at 12.30 noon, with 60,000 people already waiting in the stadium. The band was still at the Continental Hyde Hotel and waited. Graham gave in and signed the letter. Bill later said, if I hadn't, Zeppelin wouldn't have played, and we'd have had a right. The band arrived at 2 p.m. They were essentially playing behind enemy lines and unbeknownst to them. Their final U.S. show of their career.
song that should be dedicated to uh, when we 1960 uh, um, uh, I think it was 68 when we first came to the Fillmore it might have been 69 there was an amazing atmosphere about the whole of San Francisco and all the surrounding areas something that you couldn't have really experienced anywhere else but in this town and when, and when you go back to England England. You look back to California and you think about all the dreams that all the dreams that you had and all the dreams that everybody else had. So I guess this song relates to those days and the extensions. July 25th, the Oakland SWAT team surrounded the Continental Height Hotel. Police officers arrested Grant, tour manager Richard Cole, Bonham and Binden. They were all charged with assault. Bill Graham filed a $2 million civil suit. Years of bad blood with Peter Grant made this worse. It is was a clash of tough promoters. Graham was the undisputed boss of West Coast gigs, but Peter Grant was the one manager he could never rip off. His official statement published in the San Francisco Chronicle read, There were 10 years of an ongoing respectful relationship between the members of the Led Zeppelin organization and myself. However, the incident in question encroached on moral boundaries. Now that I've seen the horror, I cannot help but wonder how much of this did in fact go on in the past with these people. Steve Weiss bailed the Zepp crew at $250 each. July 26, 1977. The Jones family headed for a Midwest vacation, while the rest flew to New Orleans for their next show on the 30th. After arriving at a Mason Dupai hotel early in the morning, Robert got a call from his wife Maureen. Their five-year-old son was seriously ill with a viral infection. Less than one hour later, Maureen called back. Carac plant had passed away. Peter Grant was tracked down to a boat, where he was fishing with his son. He focused on getting Robert back to his family, as soon as possible. Their pilots were not allowed by law from flying again for several hours. It was late afternoon, when they finally left New Orleans. Plant then made an overnight trip from New York to London with John Bonham by his side. Their remaining shows were cancelled including the Louisiana Superdome gig. Peter Grant called Bill Graham with a message he regretted years later. I hope you are happy. Thanks to you Robert Plant's kid died today. Love song so pure and sincere, it transcends rock music. Robert's tribute for his son Karak is a sublime moment in Zeppelin's history. 
John Paul Jones captures melancholy and hope to great effect, and a monumental keyboard solo in the middle section. Jimmy's guitar on the track features the bee bender, a mechanical device added on one of his telecasters, which pulled the bee string up, while the instrument moved in opposite direction. John Paul Jones! John Paul Jones! But by the time you got through in through the outdoor, your name was all over the place. What took so long for you to actually start to become such a prolific writer? Well, I, I was writing quite a bit. Um, you know, Black Dog and all this. Quite a bit before. But I found the trick on in through the outdoor. If you, if you got to rehearsal early, like, you know, Robert was there, we wrote the songs, you know, Jimmy come in, hey, how have we done it? You know, it's really easy. Okay. Hang out with us a bit longer. All My Love is another uh, removal again. It was one of the times when Jonesy and I got there first <laughs> to the, the rehearsal room. And I said, now, why don't we find some real, let's do some real simple stuff now. You know, let's try and do some things with a, a really nice hook in that is really pretty, you know, something that is short, sweet, pretty and to the point. Mm -hmm. I think that All My Love really is a, well it's a song that in the end I'd like to be remembered for really, as much as Stairway. Really? Yeah. I find after a while that like people, I don't know, Stairway, if you sing it a lot, and if you've gone through one or two trials and thingy bobs, in the end you think, how can I sing this and feel the way I felt, you know? Mm -hmm. And all my love is an extension of it, if you like. Page was worried about the track, calling it a little soft. I could just imagine people doing the wave and all of that. And I thought that is not us, in its place it was fine, but I would not have wanted to pursue that direction in the future. Nothing can take away the brilliance of this masterpiece, which would also work as blueprint for Robert Plant's solo career endeavors. I'd surprise my world is changing within this frame of As opposed to the fade-out we hear on the studio version, the rehearsal take shows a majestic and heartfelt ending that would later be used on live renditions. In 79, you surprised me in the interview we did. You told me that you wanted to be remembered for, and I was waiting for all sorts of songs, but the song was for all of my love. And mm -hmm. you said you, that at that time, up to that <clears throat> point, you considered it to be uh, your most definitive work. Do you still feel that? I think I was in the middle of that whole beautiful thing that was going on. I, mean, I use beautiful not in inverted commas. It was nice, you know? Mm -hmm. And that was the mo one of the more recent things that we'd done that I really liked. It was very melodic, very simple. It was, <clears throat> if you like, closer to Brill building material, you know, all the sort of Goffin King stuff, the nice, short, crisp song. So at that time, I probably said that and I probably meant it. But I mean, if you look, and now as I look back, there's loads of things. I mean, what can I say? 